Hey, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Ray Sweet. I'm the lead pastor here at First Christian Church of Greensburg, Indiana. You can always check us out at fccgreensburg.com or our FCC Greensburg Facebook page. But hey, thank you so much for tuning in. My prayer today is that God will take his word and use it to mold and shape you and I both more and more into his image. Now, there was a little boy named Phoenix who came running into the kitchen yelling, Mama, Mama, I know what spiritual gift God has given to me. See, apparently in his Christian school, they were talking about gifts the Lord gives and the reasons why. And yet I think he missed the last part of that conversation because when his mama said, well, tell me, Phoenix, what gift has God given you? He smiled real big and he said, well, I can blow up a whoopee cushion with my nose. <laughs> and I think I have that gift too, but that's disgusting. But not too long at, later after that, he kind of changed his tune when he was asked to speak for a school event. His Nana called to congratulate him, and he said, Nana, I now think my spiritual gift is speaking. Maybe I'll preach the Word of God someday. <laughs> See, that's probably a little bit more like it right there. But hey, I'm so glad that you joined us today, and I want to welcome you back here to the 10th week of our series called The Power of Unity. We're walking through 1 Corinthians, which is basically a case study on how to not do church. So hopefully we here at FCC are learning from Paul's encouraging and piercing words what a healthy, unified, God-honoring church looks like. But listen, today we're going to talk about a topic that may not be as controversial or controversial in our culture as, say, chapter 6 on sexual immorality, but this one for sure has been controversial among believers for 2,000 years. We're going to expand on what we talked about last week and talk about the list of spiritual gifts that Paul shared here in the earlier part of chapter 12. But here's the thing. I am convinced that what we're talking about today, the differences that Christians hold on this topic, this is not a salvation issue. There's a famous statement in the Christian church movement that says, in matters of essentials, unity. So that means in those core doctrines that the Bible is so clear on, we're going to unify and we will not budge. Then it says, in matters of opinion, liberty. So there's going to be some, some issues the Bible doesn't speak directly on, or, or maybe good Bible-believing Christians may see a little differently. You know what? Those are things we're just going to show some freedom towards, but in all things, love. So we're going to take last week's discussion on spiritual gifts and just the reality that my gifts uh, are not about me, but all about the glory of God. And we're going to talk about two different words today, edify and transform. Now, spiritual gifts given by the Spirit are meant to do one of two things, and sometimes both. Edify the saved, or you could say help other believers grow to maturity in their faith, and then second, transform a lost world as they are led to the foot of the cross to discover hope in Jesus. See, gifts are not about us. It's all about glorifying God and His will being done in this world. Because there's an amazing freedom when we take attention off of ourselves and we worship the only one who is deserving of our praise. So, here's the deal. The Corinthian church that Paul is writing to is a mess. And their attitudes really aren't much better. And outside of the ungodly fruit that some of their lives are bearing, there's also fighting and factions and division in their midst. And one of the issues is spiritual gifts and how they are using them to put some on a pedestal and then to look down on others. They're even abusing them in worship, causing distractions and chaos when we know that our God is a God of order and peace. So go ahead and grab your Bibles for me and start to turn with me here to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. And as you are, let me share a phrase with you that I heard a great Bible teacher by the name of Skip Heidzig say. He says, the Holy Spirit comes for us to save us. He comes 
into us to sanctify us, and he comes upon us to supercharge us. So I think we kind of get the salvation part and the sanctification part where he it's about what he does in us to to want to save us and then how he wants to grow us. But what does he mean by the supercharge us part? See, this is where spiritual gifts comes into play because they are not your natural talents. They are supernatural gifts imparted by God's perfect will upon us as his children when we are walking in his salvation. So let's start here in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Here's what it says. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That also can mean to bring us together. So today we're going to talk specifically about nine different gifts that Paul mentions in this short passage here in verses 8 through 10. But if you look at 1 Corinthians 12, specifically uh, verses 28 through 30, and then Romans 12, 6 through 8, Ephesians 4, 11, we find what most scholars would say are 19 or 20 different spiritual gifts that are spoken about. And then you take last week's passage and a couple of our gifts with our unique God-given personalities, the reality that, that the same gift can look different depending on the person. For instance, my wife has the gift of teaching, but she's fantastic with teaching children. I feel much more comfortable teaching adults. And so you put all that together while also realizing that we may each have several spiritual gifts at the same time in different seasons of life, in different circumstances. And man, the possibilities, the combinations are endless because we serve a creative and awesome God of power. So what was the purpose of spiritual gifts? To edify the church body and to transform the lost. Notice it should never be about me. And the Lord, I just pray, forgive us when we make it about the flesh and the flesh flares up and I become all about me. And this is why we see chaos in so many churches over spiritual gifts. But when we can keep our eyes focused on Jesus and lift him up, when his body is growing to maturity, the loss is being brought to salvation, man, that's when we're going to see the Lord do some awesome things in our midst. So, I don't have fancy points for this outline today. I just want to walk you through the gifts pretty quickly, actually. So turn with me here, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, and we're going to look at the first part of that verse. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. So let's talk about the gift of wisdom. Who was the wisest man in the Bible? Solomon, right? God granted him that wisdom, and, and there's an Old Testament story in 1 Kings chapter 3 where two women come to Solomon, and they both are claiming that this baby is their own. One of them had a baby pass away, and the other claims that the living baby is theirs. And they're fighting over this baby, and one of them is clearly lying. So Solomon, in his God-given wisdom, says, okay, let's cut the baby in half, and you can both get an equal part. Well, that doesn't sound like wisdom at all, does it? But watch what happens here. One woman is fine with that, and the other says, uh-uh, no way, just let her have the baby. She can raise him, just don't harm him. And that's how Solomon realizes, wow, the real mother would give a child away to keep him safe rather than her baby being killed. And he gives the baby to that lady. But you might ask, Shouldn't all of us who are believers have some wisdom? Absolutely. Wisdom is God's word lived out. But the gift of wisdom that the Spirit can supernaturally impart is different than just regular wisdom that we all seek to have through the word of God and applying it to our lives. It's supernatural wisdom for the purpose to edify the body or draw the lost to Jesus. And I got to tell you, as a lead pastor trying to lead this church faithfully, there are some very difficult circumstances that come across my desk. So I pray and I ask 
the Lord, please give me wisdom here. I also lean hard on our staff and our elders and their wisdom as well. And there have been times where a situation that's not so black and white involving people who are messy, who see things differently than one another, have come across my desk. And I have felt the Lord give me wisdom in those situations where, honestly, it worked out great. Satan's plans were thwarted and God was glorified. And I bet you can think of some godly people, probably in your own life, who just seem in difficult situations to have that godly wisdom. So that's the the gift of wisdom. Now let's talk about the gift of knowledge. The second part of verse 8 actually puts it like this. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the Spirit. Now, this gift is often seen in one of two ways, and some great Bible scholars see it both ways, so it's okay depending on whatever way you see it. It's all right, but but first, some see this as the ability to dig deeper into God's Word and understand the depths of Scripture. These people are often those who maybe have received a great biblical education and just understand all the ins and outs of God's Word. And while I think that's very important, honestly, that falls under a gift that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. From what I've studied, I fall into the second camp. I think this is referring to knowledge that is supernaturally imparted from the Lord, like Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. See, this is where the early church was so committed to Christ that they were selling property and possessions and giving them to the church to help those in need. And Ananias and Sapphira, a married couple, had sold property and decided to keep some of it for themselves. And that's okay. I mean, they didn't have to sell it in the first place. It was theirs. They had every right. The problem came when they lied about it. They said they were given all the money to the Lord. And here's what Peter says in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Then Peter said, to Anna, to, said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money that you received from the land? So later his wife comes in separately and is given the same opportunity to tell the truth. She lies as well and both of them meet the same tragic end. But here's the point. Peter shouldn't have had a clue about any of this. It's not like he had spies working for him. He wouldn't have known what they got for the land and the private uh, conversations between a husband and a wife. And yet the Holy Spirit gave him this knowledge. Why? To edify and transform. This was supernaturally imparted to him as a word of knowledge. And I believe this gift is still given from the Lord to edify and transform so that the church can grow and lives can be saved for Christ. And here's the third gift, the gift of faith. The gift of faith. See, in the first part of 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 9, it says, To another, faith by the same Spirit. To be clear, Hebrews 11.6 is true for all of us who are followers of Jesus. You may know this. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So yes, it takes faith to follow Jesus. It takes faith to walk with him every day. So we're not talking about a saving faith. This is supernatural faith that simply Trust God in what seems like circumstances around you that are impossible. This is a faith that is just so admirable when everything in life seems to be going against that faith. Recently, I read a biography uh, by a guy named, about a guy named George Mueller. He lived from 1805 to 1898. In his early adulthood, he was led to go to Bristol, England to start an orphanage. But here's where his faith comes in. He never advertised his needs. He refused to receive a paycheck in that or from his church. And yet millions of dollars in the 1800s. Now imagine the the, uh, amount that would be worth today. But millions of dollars went through his hands to help build these orphanages and provide for these kids. 
and yet he had faith in the Lord that all of that would happen. Over the decades, that, that one orphanage grew to several, even large, massive buildings where hundreds of kids could be stored at a time, and he raised over 10,000 orphans in his life. And one day in his later years, as hundreds, I forget exactly how many, but it was in the hundreds of kids were in the orphanage at one time, the workers came to him and they said, listen, we don't have any more food. There's nothing we can do to stretch anything. And so he gathered all the kids at the tables. They prayed, they thanked God for their food. The kids didn't know that there was nothing being prepared, but George Mueller had trusted the Lord all these years and he knew that God would be faithful again. A couple minutes later, there's a knock at the door. It was a man who owned a bakery. And he said, hey, about two o'clock this morning, the Lord woke me up suddenly and he told me, go to the bakery, breaks, bake some bread for the orphanage. The guy said, so I got all this wagon load full of bread. Can you use it? And George Mueller just smiled and said, yeah, we could use it. As they were getting the bread passed out, there was another knock at the door. It was a milk delivery man whose axle had broken on his wagon right by the orphanage. To get it fixed, they had to unload the full wagon and give it away before it went sour. And he said, hey, can you use this milk? I know it's a lot, but can you use it? And George Mueller smiled again and said, sure. See, this man was an extraordinary example of having that gift of faith in situations that seemed impossible, where most people would have ran out of them, okay? But he knew that he served a God of the impossible and that faith did two things in the lives of others, edify and transform. Now let's look at a couple more gifts before we get into the ones that may be a little more debated. The first here is the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. So go ahead, look at the second part here of verse 10 with me back in 1 Corinthians 12. Paul refers to another gift here when he says, to another prophecy. To another prophecy. So this word is often misunderstood and people think it means to predict the future, but the Greek word used here literally means to speak forth or to proclaim. And this is the gift of preaching where the Spirit gives the gift and empowers someone to be able to understand the Word and proclaim God's Word effectively. We even read in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. See, understanding the truth of God's Word and being able to explain it practically, that is so important because the Word of God is powerful to change lives, and there always seems to be a shortage of those with the gift of prophecy or preaching. Now here's the fifth gift, the gift of discernment. The gift of discernment. So also here, if you look back to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10, the third part of that verse puts it like this, to another distinguishing between spirits. So this sounds funny, but it literally means to separate, separate out for examination or to determine what is genuine and what is counterfeit. That is the word discernment. First John 4, 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And even a passage like Acts 17, 11, we read about a great example. And you've probably heard of these guys. It says, Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. See, when it comes to teaching, we compare everything to the Word of God. But this gift is also needed in the church to discern whether others' actions are from God or not. And God imparts this gift where some in the church have an incredible ability to step back and listen to the Holy Spirit's discernment in certain and difficult situations. Here's why. Satan is the great deceiver. He's the father of lies, and he loves to weasel his way and disrupt two things, edification and transformation. Okay, now I know I'm going through these pretty quick, and we've been a little more into 
kind of teacher mode here today, but now we come to the four on the list that have often been a little controversial or debated. And as I was preparing for this message, I didn't take it lightly. I called some believers I know who have great wisdom in God's word. I got some different perspectives on this. I also listened to some Bible teachers that I trust. And for those of you who've ever studied God's word, uh, maybe for years, maybe you have a depth in God's word, you know that a lot of conservative Bible-believing Christians believe that some of these gifts are no longer in use, that they were temporary. They were imparted on the early church in Paul's day with Jesus and in Paul's day uh, to kind of get the church off the ground, to, to show Jesus was the Messiah. That was a new concept then. And the word of God was not yet complete at that time. And there are wonderful Bible-believing Christians who just don't feel that they are in operation now that we have the word of God at our fingertips. They believe based on some scriptures and things like speaking that speak, things like speaking in tongues and healings are no longer active spiritual gifts in the church imparted to believers, although God can still do what he wants to do. So, while I respect that view and have a lot of dear friends who hold to it, a lot of people probably in our church hold to it, um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I'm just not able to quite go there. I personally feel like the gifts of the Spirit are still active. But, but here's the key. Active within biblical parameters. And it may be true that, that we don't see miracles and healings and the biblical definition of speaking in tongues as much as we once did, but I never ever want to limit what God can do through broken vessels like you and me. So let's group these last four spiritual gifts into two categories. And the sixth one will be healings and miracles. Healings and miracles. So go ahead and look back to 1 Corinthians 12, 9 with me. It says, to another, the gifts of healing by one spirit, to another, miraculous powers. Uh, this picture many people have in their heads are basically those famous faith healers on TV who do and say so many things that contradict the Word of God. And as the stories have come out from the behind-the-scenes healing crusades, things like manipulation, sensationalism, corruption are often close by. And it doesn't help their cause that they often beg for more and more money, and then they use it on lavish lifestyles, multiple homes on beaches, private jets. It's usually a picture of fame, fortune, and corruption. And I've often wondered if they have uh, this gift, why aren't they visiting hospitals to heal the sick? It just doesn't add up. And it's probably because it's all about money to so many people. But, but I want to be careful not to run to the other extreme either, because we still serve Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals spiritually and physically and emotionally. And throughout the pages of God's word, we see Jesus heal the blind, raise the dead, make the leper clean again. And we see him work through his disciples to do a lot of the same things. And he even puts it like this in John 14, verse 12. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And Jesus says that I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, key words there, in my name. That does not mean that God is a genie who does whatever you want. It means that God moves in powerful ways when we do everything in the name of Christ according to his perfect will. So, as we get this picture out of our heads of attention-seeking people wanting this gift for their own selfish benefit, what if God brings someone into your path who's sick and the Holy Spirit lays it on your heart that you need to pray over them? And then stop me if you've ever heard this before, but they go back to the doctor and the sickness, the cancer, whatever it was that showed up on the test, all of a sudden is gone. The scans are clean. 
I think about a member of our church when he was in his early 20s and was diagnosed with cancer, even told that he may just have a few months left to live. It was that bad, and it was a rough time on this young family. He suffered in ways that I can't imagine. And one day he ran into an elder uh, here at FCC, and they invited him to come to an elders meeting to be prayed over. And um, some, what, 17, probably 18 years later now, he's still cancer free. See, whether we're talking about physical healing or some miracle that God performs, the whole purpose is for edification and transformation. And if we always walk in step with the Holy Spirit, he delights in using us for his glory. Okay, and we've saved the last most interesting one here, the gift of tongues. So here's what Paul says in verse 10. He says, To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another, the interpretation of tongues. I'll never forget a man in our church in Tennessee. And if you'll just kind of lighten up with me a little bit, even if you don't agree with exactly everything I'm going to say, uh, we had a guy in in Tennessee at our church named Dave. He was a very dynamic personality, a follower of Jesus. And one time the topic of speaking in tongues came up and Dave said with a real big smile on his face, I knew he was joking. He said, listen, Ray, I can teach you how to speak in tongues. And I looked at him knowing that he was up to something. And I said, oh yeah? And that's what Dave said, yeah, it's this easy. You just say these words really fast. See my bow tie, tie my bow tie. See my bow tie, tie my bow tie. See my bow tie, tie my bow tie. Say that 10 times fast. But anyways, I realized that in a church of our size, with whoever's watching this, we have people who come from different backgrounds. Some of you are from very conservative backgrounds, maybe even very liturgical backgrounds, where speaking in tongues was just a no-no. You just didn't even talk about it. Where even talking about gifts was often something that just didn't happen in your church. Others came from the other end, the charismatic movement, where this was a every Sunday thing in worship services. And things were wild. They were exciting. People were running around and falling down and all kinds of things. Or maybe you fall somewhere in the middle of that. Maybe the spiritual gift stuff is kind of new to you in the first place. So I want to be respectful to your background while also sticking to what Scripture teaches us on this topic, because a lot of our misunderstandings are from abuses of the spiritual gift, just like what was happening in the Corinthian church. And Paul spends an entire chapter in this letter, chapter 14, um, almost, almost entirely dealing with this gift that was being misused and done for selfish gain rather than to edify and transform. So let me correct a couple false teachings. There are groups out there that will tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, that you are not saved. They teach that all believers should speak in tongues. And apparently that was floating around the Corinthian church too, because Paul has already corrected this way of thinking. In in 1 Corinthians 12, if you kind of look down there to verses 27 through 30, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see where he talks about each of us having different gifts, but that we don't all have the same gifts. And he says, do all speak in tongues? And the answer is a rhetorical answer, but it's an emphatic no. The answer is supposed to be no, we don't all speak in tongues. And I can tell you personally that I have never spoken tongues. I've had wonderful times of worship with the Lord where he was just moving in my life in big ways, but I've never spoken in tongues. And I I walk with Jesus every day. So... There it is. So because the picture that we see here in Corinthian, in this Corinthian church looks a lot like the chaos that we still see in some churches today, just absolute madness and worship as people are doing crazy things uh, in the spirit, right, that doesn't match God's word. Did you know that the word for tongues does not mean gibberish like you often hear spoken where people are just making up words? Tongues is not some made-up language. The word for tongues that is used here 
that's also used in Acts chapter 2 is known language. And back at Pentecost in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit first came upon believers and the church was launched into the world, a very special occasion, these believers spoke languages they had never learned before, and they spoke them through the Spirit to preach the gospel to others. And if you look at a passage like 1 Corinthians 14, 22, and I want to read this from the New Living Translation. It says, so you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. A sign where God can give that miraculous gift. And I've heard of this happening in other countries throughout this world, even today with missionaries, where someone will think they're speaking their modern tongue and they're really speaking another language, and they lead someone to Christ. So I know I've probably caused more questions today than maybe I've given answers, and there's always room for a much bigger discussion on this topic. But let me give you the big picture here, because I, I know we kind of get drugged down in the weeds sometimes, but let's look at the big picture of this passage. When it comes to spiritual gifts, they are given for two purposes to edify the church, for the church to grow and become more mature every day and to transform the lost where they discover hope in Jesus. And when the church uses the gifts given by the Spirit, chaos doesn't ensue. There's peace, there's order, there's power, and to go along with the whole theme of 1 Corinthians, there's unity among God's people as we die to ourselves and we live for Jesus. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for these words of hope. God, you know how seriously I took this passage this week, and you know that um, this is a tough one, that a lot of wonderful, godly, Bible-believing Christians have a little different perspective on, and we understand that it's not a salvation issue, but I just pray that you'll give us clarity that you'll take these words, that you will use them, and that we may grow closer to you in the process. So Father, thank you for, for touching on this difficult topic, for teaching us, and we just pray that we can be edified, those of us in the church, and that you can use these words to bring anyone who doesn't know you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you for these words of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, this was, a, this was a tough topic. I get it. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. If you want to talk about um, giving your life to Jesus, you can reach out to us. My name is Ray Sweet. I'm the lead pastor here at First Christian Church of Greensburg, Indiana. Go ahead and give us a call, 812-663-8488, or you can email me at ray at fccgreensburg.com. Hey, God bless you. Hope you have a great week.